again, like it, it kind of in, in keeping with the uh, the talks, uh, the the you know three game industry talks from today, because the compression talk was definitely like kind of a more of a theoretical one. But uh, I kind of tried to select all of the talks from today to be about the sorts of things uh, that I can't really address on Handmade Hero directly, right? They're not the kind of things that you're really going to talk about uh, when you're looking at something from the perspective of you know one or two people who are working on something, and you you know you're never really going to get to the kinds of uh, either personnel scale or data scale or any of the other things uh, that really start to introduce these sort of other problems that exist for no reason other than scale. They're like scale only problems. Uh, and uh, so what I wanted to do was sort of get uh, some perspective on just like, okay, for, for you know, a, a big AAA title, one that's like, you know, supposed to be kind of a flagship game where you're, you're going to be seeing all kinds of like, you know, high-end visuals, high-end audio, these sorts of things. Uh, what exactly is sort of the workflow like on one of these? And, you know, especially in the case where you have sort of like a pedigree engine or something where it's been refined over time, like, what does it look like when this thing's working well? And, you know, also when it doesn't go well, certainly, but just like give us some perspective on the things that have to happen there. So I, I invited Jason Greger to talk to us about how they do things at Naughty Dog, uh, which I think is going to be fantastic because I know nothing about how your stuff is, is architected and I'm really excited to learn. So please give him a warm welcome. So give us some background on, on you again, so the people who, who aren't familiar with you kind of know, like, how did you get into uh, the industry? Like, what's, uh, you know, what's sure. your background, obviously? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually, well, I'm Canadian. Um, uh, I went to University of Waterloo, and I took uh, something called systems design. Any Waterloo people? It sounds like it. Yeah, oh, sweet. Several. OK, awesome. Um, I took something called systems design engineering. And actually, at the time, I thought, uh, you know, I thought I'd get into robotics or process control or working on rocket ships, I don't know, something. Something that melds uh, different kinds of engineering, because that's what we got. We got a little mechanical, a little electrical, and so on. Uh, but as it turned out, programming was something that, excuse me, I was doing at home, and I, was, I had a lot of experience with. And all of the jobs and things I was getting was in that vein. So I ended up going down the just straight up programming route. So I'm just a software guy now, and yeah. don't do a lot of hardware, other a little bit of experience. Um, so, And it's funny, actually, when I got into game industry, I worked outside the game industry for a while. And then when I got into it, my mom, actually, I remember talking with her, and she goes, uh, oh, that's really great news. But uh, I wonder if you ever want to get a real job. <laughs> I'm like, OK. But so I had to explain oh. to her that actually, games is probably one of the best places to be as an engineer, because you get all this wide breadth of different technology, right? So, so anyway, that's kind of how I got into it. Um, started at Midway in San Diego, and then EA, and then finally at, at Naughty Dog. OK, so that's, that's like actually quite a bit of uh, different Experience with different places. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, at, uh, at Naughty Dog, like currently, you're. Um, I, I guess you've you've kind of been there for a, a pretty wide span of games too. Because you mm -hmm. give us a little bit of background, like when you came in uh, yeah. to Naughty Dog, and like how you've kind of, you know, what you've been involved in. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, very close to being a decade dog, which is what we call it. Ah. Um, so almost. Uh, I started right when we were in the middle of Uncharted One, okay. and uh, it was an interesting time actually because we were we were kind of going through. Uh, a big change from the way we used to do things on the Jack games to what we were going to do on the new engine, and everything was being rewritten in C++. And so it was, it, there was a lot of um, sort of technical upheaval, if you will. When we say and, rewritten uh, C++, it was originally written in straight C. No, actually, um, Jack and the games before that and Crash and everything was written in a language called Goal, which is a Lisp-based thing, amazingly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was, yeah. It was pretty amazing because they wrote their own, like, custom, and I mean, Lisp is not a difficult language to parse, and Certainly. it's a relatively minimal language, so it, it's conceivable that you could do this. But they basically built um, their own compiler, their own language, and it was based on there was C under the hood and some low-level assembly language code for the really high-performance stuff. But everything else was built, like everything um, was built in this Lisp language. So what do you mean by everything? Like, give us an example of the lowest-level component that's still built. <laughs> it, it, I mean, obviously, yeah. it wasn't your code base, so yeah. I. Yeah, I don't actually know for sure, okay. but I do know that, for example, the game object model. So anytime okay. you have a crate or Jack himself or whatever, that was a goal sort of object, right? And there was goal code. And the cool thing is you could do this thing called Control-T where you could rebuild the code and have it live update in the game. So you could right. just be iterating like crazy. As it turns out, we actually still have that in C++. Okay. Um, you know how you can, in Visual Studio, you can do apply code changes under the debug menu? And before that, when we were on PS3 with 
um, SN Systems compilers, we actually worked with SN to make sure that that, that worked, that you could live update your code, because it's super important to be able to I iterate see. like that. And I guess yeah. since that's the workflow that everyone was used to, you don't want to give that up just because you're moving away from goal. Right, right. Okay. And, and actually, an, another interesting point is that we still use a Lisp-like language today, but only for two things. We use it for data definition. Okay. Um, so this is a rapid way of getting uh, data that can be expressed easily in a text format into the game. Okay. And I can talk in more detail about that. Uh, sure. It's kind of interesting. And then we also use it as a runtime scripting language. So you literally are scripters. When you're a designer at Naughty Dog, the first thing you do is you get a book on Scheme. You go, okay, I'm going to learn the basic syntax here. And what you basically learn, right, what you basically learn is that, uh, you know, function argument A comma argument B just turns into function A, B. There, you're done. Got it. You got it. Okay. <laughs> well, not really, but uh, it's kind of like that. So, um, yeah. We, that, we, is, that is actually pretty fascinating. Okay. Yeah, All yeah. Right. and it comes partly from that history. And it also comes from the fact we've considered changing this many times. Because okay. believe me, this language has its issues. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it, for example, it takes us to build our entire game from scratch. Uh, you know, well, now we're actually doing a distributed build and it's even faster, but it used to be maybe maybe seven minutes or 10 minutes okay. to build the entire game, okay. and then 15 to build this stuff. <laughs> yeah, like it was really worse. Yeah. OK. So it's, it's been and a bit of a. when you say build that stuff, you mean it's sort like, of just to ingest the text and output whatever the final format was yeah. for these data definitions yeah. and so on. Because what we're actually doing is we're running Scheme code. And so here, herein lies the reason why we still use it. Um, scheme, uh, anybody who's familiar with okay, very, with Scheme very or Lisp or Racket now? Um, one of the beautiful things about this language, right, because uh, basically, it blurs the line between code and data, right? Like that there could be a function f with arguments a and b, or it could be a data array that just contains values f, a, and b. And moreover, there's a very, very powerful macro language built into Racket and Scheme that allows you to transform one, what we call an s expression, which is a parenthesized expression like this into another. And so you can basically have code that writes code. And so what it means is we can define custom data structures. Like, for example, we have a system called the animation overlay system, where we can take animations from one character. And we can say, no, for this new character, all of the animations are the same, except for these ones, where we're going to overlay new animations. And to do that, we just make a little syntax where you just you know, do something like you know, uh, uh, source animation gets overwritten by destination animation. And then you have a whole list of these in some other big data structure that's like define um, you know, anim overlays or something. Oh, and by the way, hyphens in this language are just symbols. So it's not minus. It's just part of the name. It's weird. But anyway, so we can just define custom syntax. And then that just spits out data that our engine can suck in very easily. Yeah. So essentially, you've, you've in, in your data description language, you have metaprogramming, which you are yeah. sort of doing on the fly here. And yeah. uh, I guess as a consequence of that, it's like, yeah, there could be fairly complicated metaprograms running at ingest time. So it's not as straightforward as just saying, I took in this text, yeah. I output this binary. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. The alternative that most other studios do is they'll say, let's go with XML or JSON, or let's write our own custom parsers. Yes. But then, excuse me, anytime you want to add new data, you have to write more parser code. And some programmer has to do that. Here, well, it's the same. Some programmer still has to do it. But they do it in Scheme, all right? So they'll literally right. just write a macro. And a lot of times, it's really simple. Like, there'll be this thing called syntax rules that literally just say, if you see this pattern of code, transform it to this pattern of code, and that's so it. So there's like a pattern matching element to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But then it can get way more complicated than that. And uh, so usually, it's the programmers that are doing that stuff more than the designers, although they dabble in it, too. So and how neat. essential is that, I guess, you know, when you're so, you know, and I guess not to dive in too, too fast, too quickly here. Sure. but um, so if I'm looking at this and I'm saying, wow, it's taking 17 minutes or something to, to process this stuff, how essential is it to have that flexibility there? Is it, is it actually like, no, we really use this stuff. Like yeah. it, we couldn't just build 12 transforms that we tend to call upon and have that work. It's, it's right. actually flexible. Or could you give some uh, yeah, insight yeah. to that? So first of all, when I say it's like 12 or 15 minutes of build, that's if you were to rebuild everything from scratch, right? Yes, right? Yes. And so the iteration time, though, if I just am building, I make a small change to my animation overlays, we have this um, thing where you can just say, OK, just build that one file. Boop, it builds in you know, maybe 30 seconds, 10 seconds. It depends, right? It's pretty see. quick. And then it's, it sends a message directly to the game um, using a Redis server where it's like a re remote procedure call to the game, basically, and pipes in the new data. And so we can just live update that data. So they can be you know, a designer or an animator or whoever can be okay. just working on the game and 
and make changes very quickly. All right, I want to unpack that whole thing in a second here, but yeah, uh, but yeah. before uh, before I guess I get into that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you said just just before we started here that you were like, I want to tell like a, a, oh, right. a sort of uh, emergency fire story. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, after having listened to Chris's uh, session. Right. Well, why don't you go ahead and do that? So yeah. we've got that in the in the sort of. Uh, Totally, totally. I might draw some more, so yep. you can say I'm Please. a drawer. So, um, so yeah, uh, it's interesting because um, I mean, every studio has this, right? You develop a big game, you start off thinking, okay, we've got all our tools in place, everything's good, we've shipped a bunch of other games, it's going to be fine. And then you realize, okay, like the, the, the jump, let's say, from Uncharted 3 to The Last of Us, um, Uncharted 3 we thought was a big game, and then we got to The Last of Us where, honestly, it was really more of a PS4 game that was just trying to be squeezed into a PS3, and then that's why we made the remastered version, actually, is because, honestly, it was really almost PS4 content. And, um, and then the jump from The Last of Us remastered to Uncharted 4 was another, I'd say, depending on the kind of asset you're dealing with, it could be 2x, it could be 5x. Wow. In terms of just the amount of data, the amount of just the size of the levels, everything was much, much bigger. So we had our own growing pains. And I used to think our problems were bad until I heard Chris's talk. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, but so what's really interesting about this whole thing, and this is something you learn with experience, right, is that d depending on the decisions you make early on, right, in, or the decisions that have been made over years and years of, of your studio uh, and the technology you have, it leads to a certain class of problems, a certain kinds of problems that you'll hit. And so the problems that we hit were completely different than the problems that they had with, with Halo and Destiny, um, just because we made different choices, and so it led to a different, right? Uh, it's kind of like a chaotic system, depending on the, the initial, initial conditions. Things. Yeah. So. You know you're going to have something bad happen. You right. just don't know what <laughs> it's going to be. What the heck yeah. it's going to be, exactly. So in our case, um, we, we do, OK. So. Let me actually back up and I'll give you guys a little bit of a flavor of, of the way our pipelines look at a high picture uh, level. Um, okay, so th this is something that I found really interesting when I first got to Naughty Dog. We have this philosophy that I haven't seen in any other game studio where um, you know, at EA, we spend a lot of time on dealing with, okay, we're going to publish a stable version of the game, and that'll go out every couple of days, and then we'll have people working on branches, and they can integrate in carefully, and, and it was all just very staged and so on. And at Naughty Dog, it's wild, wild west. It's like, we, right. just, we just run the latest version of the code all, right. all the time, all right. uh, and we run the latest versions of the assets all the time. There is no such thing as it works on my machine, really. Okay. Which is amazing, actually, in a way. Um, oh, by the way, EA has a conference room whose name is it works on my machine. Oh, really? I just, yeah, I should just I should let you know that. Um, but um, but uh, uh, so it was. It's a really different way of thinking about things. And so check it out. So what we do is we whenever we check in code, um, we have a number of different code branches for things like um, this game is already shipped and we're doing DLC versus this is a game that's being live developed. Okay, right? When you say code branches, you mean in your source code control system? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so in Perforce, Perforce let's say, okay. we'll have a branch that is right. main, which is the main tip of development for all the games that are actively in development. I see. And then we'll have branches for like uh, when Uncharted 4 shipped, we branched that off, and now we have you know U4 Final, and that branch is just it's pristine and it's clean. And then if we're making bug fixes or we're doing yes. DLC, we can do it in that branch and not. And meanwhile, it can be Wild Wild West on the main branch again right. uh, for whatever else we keep so working. So it kind of on, gets right? calved off, and now it's like the, you know people yeah. who are trying to maintain that already shipped project are, are in there. Everyone else is on is on your Wild Wild right. West mainline. Exactly, and people will jump back and forth. I mean, the other thing that's interesting about Naughty Dog is we have a um, uh, very small, actually very small engineering team considering the size of the game. So we how, have, how big is it? So, so I would say we have about, I mean, again, orders of magnitude, we have about 10 uh, programmers who are just focused on graphics, yeah. maybe 15 to 20 that do what we call gameplay, which is basically everything else that's runtime that isn't graphics. Okay. And there's specialties in there, so like AI. that might include physics or something. Yeah, AI, it? physics. And like, but to give you a sense, we have one guy. Well, actually, for a while, it was me and one other guy that was working on it, and then it's this other guy. And, but it's generally one or two people who own a big system like physics for a while. And then they might move on and own something else, and somebody else comes into that role. Um, so maybe 15, 20 gameplay programmers doing all sorts of stuff. And at the, for most of the time I've been there, two tools programmers, which is crazy. Wow. Yeah. And so how in the heck do we make a game? And honestly, I don't really know sometimes. Okay. So you're how, still wondering. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, still kind of trying to figure it out. Now, since then, though, so one of our leads, Christian Yearling, has moved into the role of just, like, I'm going to own the tools. Yeah. And he's now built up that team to be four people, including okay. himself, which helps a lot. I mean, it's doubling the team size. And they're, they're starting to really um, help solve some of the technical debt that we have. So what, what I'm going to describe here 
it's not my work. This is mostly Christian and his team, and also Christoph Balestra, who is our, our uh, uh, co-president, and he sort of acts like a CTO for the company. Okay. He's also working on a lot of this, this stuff. It's sort of his area, that, and back-end servers and things like that. Okay. But, um, so we've, we've built up the, t the tools department uh, to some degree. But anyway, so um, uh, what that means is relatively small team, uh, and people take big chunks of the engine and kind of own it. Uh, okay, so back to the, the rough structure of, of our, uh, the way we do things. So um, we run the latest version of the game. A, a program will check something in, and that we have this little bot that's running. It's just a Python script that's running on, on a machine. Okay. Um, and anytime it sees a change in Perforce, yeah. it says, well, is it relevant to the branch that I'm trying to build? Yeah, okay, it's in this branch, great. That Builds I'm trying it. to build, meaning each uh, of these branches has their own build bot. Yes, exactly. A and machine, or is it um, one machine is running lots of build bots? It can be both or either, both yeah. So sometimes we have one machine dedicated or whatever. Okay. Um, and maybe different flavors too. Like we might be building the development version of the game and also a specialized, excuse me, final build of the game. Oh, okay, um, right, because yeah. there's uh, debug overlays or these sorts of things, and you, you do yeah. keep two different builds. So everyone's running the latest version of the code, yes. but different people could be running different sort of flavors of that piece of code based on whether they want. Yeah, yeah. 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 and actually, it's, it's so as an aside, it's an interesting point. Um, different flavors, building different flavors of a game uh, has pros and cons, and one of the cons is that if you're not testing the, yes. the final version, then you don't really know what you're doing. So yes. we, we only limit ourselves to two flavors. We have the, the normal release build, and we have this final build, and QA needs to test both, and we actually, as we get closer to the end of a project, we start actually building real packages or disk images, and they test off of the real deal, because if, if they don't, we're, we're kind of um, So guessing. you don't have a debug build at all? No, um, what we do have, this is another cool thing, actually, that um, there's a lot of segues here, sorry about that. But um, so <laughs> I'll, really, I'll, I'll, I yeah, gotcha. it's, it's all cool stuff that I hadn't, a lot, a lot of this is stuff I hadn't seen at other studios. So we have a thing called a hybrid build. And we used to do everything with make files. And what you do with, okay. what, what, with this is you just have a special MK file that's for you, like okay. jgregory.mk. Okay. And it lists a bunch of files in there, CPP files, that I want to have built in debug. And everything else will be released. So I can say, I'm working on animation. I'm just going to make all the animation files debug. And everything else will be released. So the game still runs reasonably well. Got it. Um, Super, super useful. Um, and uh, so, anyway. Okay, so that makes sense. So basically yeah. what happens there is it is individual programmers are in fact running some debug code. Yeah. They're only running the debug code that they actually care about at a yes. particular time. Uh, and I mean, I guess there's nothing to stop them from having star in there, which yeah. is just like give me the whole debug yes. code. Yes, okay. and although well, there is actually one thing which stops them, which is now um, our game is so big that if you do that, there isn't enough room for all the code in the space of our budget. So <laughs> you really don't want to do star because it might not actually <laughs> run. Not actually yeah. fit. Okay. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so generally that's how people work. Um, Okay, so when I check something in, the build bot builds it, and there's a web page you can go to that shows you like each check-in, and it goes green if it's built successfully, and then it publishes it, and that just means copy it up to this network drive that we call the Z drive. Okay. Um, now, this is an, another interesting thing, is that Naughty Dog is um, a hybrid Windows and Linux studio. Okay. <laughs> so we're just, we're really old school. Um, yeah. The reason for it, though, it's partly historical, and it's partly because Linux, I mean, honestly, is just better at certain things. Right. And I'll give you an example of uh, a little bit later on of one place where Linux really sh shines. But um, a couple of examples, maybe. Um, so what ends up happening then is, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the build gets copied out there. And then we have all of our source assets, like Maya files and so on. And I mean, if I can, maybe I'll just sketch out. So you know, you've got source assets over here. Can everyone see that? Yeah. yeah terrible handwriting, sorry. So you've got you know, Maya files. And you've got Photoshop, you know, PSD files. And you maybe got some ZBrush files. and. Who knows what else? And you've also got these .dc files, which are basically our scheme. These are text files that are our, um, our scheme uh, racket stuff. Um, we've also got what we call our, um, well, there, there's a tool that's a world builder called Charter. And it has a little database of files. So this is like, I'm laying out a world, and there's going to be some crates over here, and there's going to be some bad guys spawning over here. It's that kind of stuff. Or there's going to be some splines or, or trigger regions. It's all that kind of, um, if you will, kind of light data that it goes into describing a game world. And then kind of on top of all this is um, what you might call a metadata asset database. Metadata, uh, oops, DB. Um, and what this is, uh, it's metadata about all these other assets. 
In cylinder form. In cylinder form. Okay. Trying to use the traditional database symbol. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, um, so and it, you know it's always yeah. very happy. Um, so <laughs> happy database. <laughs> That's right. Sometimes it's, it's very happy. So for example, let's say you're building an animation. Um, an animator might find it really convenient to do a bunch of run cycles and squatting and jumping and so on, all in one big Maya file with a, with a timeline. But I want to break that out and say, okay, this is the run cycle, and this is idle, and this is jump, and so on. And so I have frame ranges. So that's a really simple example of some metadata that would go into this thing, where we can say, okay, there's an asset called player, you know, a Drake jump or something, and it is this Maya file, this frame range, and also these compression settings and whatever other metadata you've got. You I know? see. So in so, some yeah. sense, it's it's sort of like a, a manifest in some sense. It's like, yeah. hey, look, you're going to have to pack this stuff up and deal with it. I'm sort of giving you not only the source of it, but also some sort of like ways that the source is going to get extracted in exactly. some, some fashion. Exactly. Okay. And is that, just, just to be clear, um, so that is not also in the Lisp way that's no. just that's got some separate listing format that's more straightforward yes. than, than a yes. fully uh, programming language. Yes, and in fact, I say database because it acts like a database, but our current implementation it's a bunch of XML files or sometimes just custom text formats okay. that are stored on a Perforce server. So when you're dealing with that metadata, there's there's a, a tool that you have that we call Builder, although it's a silly name because it's really more about the data than building. Um, but you go in there and you can specify assets and all this stuff, and it just saves it by checking files in and out of Perforce and updating data that way. And what's nice about that is like text formats are great. This is, this is a, a, another sort of fundamental philosophy at Naughty Dog is, uh, is the KIS philosophy, right? Keep it simple. Um, we leave out the stupid part usually. Um, but uh, so uh, keep it simple and if something really, really simple works, do it. And okay. only solve the problem when it becomes a problem. Right. And uh, that sometimes that's bad because you, you can sometimes just think a little bit clo you know, near term. Right, right. But the good thing is we have a lot of, I think, very good senior engineers who are good at thinking about like, okay, here's my near-term solution, but in the back of my head, I know that I can jump from there to here to here to here to get to this final solution. Right. It might take me two projects to get there, but, but that's okay. I've got the plan. Yeah, yeah exactly. I and think so, that's yeah. really important too, because it's kind of one of those things where you know that that allows you to not make the mistake of let me do too much work right here and build something we didn't really need and overcomplicate yes. things. But it means that I'm not going to hit that sort of integration wall somewhere. We're like, uh-oh, yeah. yeah. now we have to tear the whole thing down, right? Exactly. So, yeah. okay. Exactly. And I mean that is so. I'd say the, the younger you are as a programmer or the less experienced you are, the more prone you are to this, which is this sense of, um, wow, programming is amazing. I can do anything. Yeah. And then I'm going to solve the general problem. In fact, yeah. I'm going to solve the problem that can, you know, I'm going to file everyone's taxes while I'm making the game. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. right? So, um, well, that you're thinking yeah, so is a, yeah, a tax solving system that they can implement right. their own taxes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, taxes yeah. in any country. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. So you, you really want to avoid that, right? Yes. And so we, we are very, very kind of, uh, Everyone from Christoph to the leads to just everybody kind of um, tries to exude this this idea of keep it simple, solve the immediate problem, have a plan for long term, and uh, deal with the issues as they come up. Um, and then it also comes back to like premature optimization. For example, yes. the old 80-20 rule. Who's heard of the 80-20 rule, right? Most people, yeah, good. So like you know, 80% uh, uh, of your time is spent in 20% of the code, or sometimes it's more like 90-10 or whatever. So you don't want to be optimizing that 80% that doesn't matter. Um, so we're very big on that. So anyway, um, so we have this metadata, and we have all these source files. And then what happens, right, is we have various tools. Now, th there are two ways you can do this. Um, one, you can say, OK, I've got a final asset at the end. So let's say it's an animation. When we say do this, you mean do an asset build. Yeah, so some sort of asset build. So we, um, we have some animation, and we actually package these things into into um, things called, so let's say we've got, uh, this is maybe animation A, and we have like anim-player, player, and this is a so-called pack file. And a pack file is just a binary format. It contains sections of data, um, and it's so it's reasonably robust to, to being able to divide it uh, out and say I've got different kinds of data in this pack file. Um, but it's usually on the, on the realm of like, okay, I'm animation player, so I've got all the core animations for the player, and that includes his run cycles and jumps and everything else, maybe in different, uh, in different demeanors. But then let's say the player needs to swim. That might be a different pack file of all the swimming animations. And then there might be another one that's just this one in-game cinematic is all just in this one pack file. Um, and, and pack files can contain other things. So animations, they can contain skeletal rigs, they can yeah. contain geometry, uh, textures, although we, we've kind of split those out a little bit, but textures, uh, materials, all that kind of stuff. And then we have special pack files for this charter data um, that, are, that we call in-game pack files, but really 
it's kind of a silly name again. What it really means is it's a, it's a light pack file that contains um, rapid iteration um, rapid iteration type data. So things like okay. the spawners in your world, splines, regions, lightweight data that can be built very quickly and that you're going to want to iterate on quickly. Okay. Um, so actually, I mean, kind of thinking back to what Chris was saying, right? Just to sort of get a little bit more perspective on that oh, sure, there. Yeah. So you're saying that these these are actually separate formats for this? Um, no, it's actually built into the same format, but it's a different kind of file that's built separately in this, in this pipeline. So, so it's really just more about what goes where, but yeah. the format's still the same. I'm not fun fundamentally building a different kind of file just because right. it's light. Right, exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah, what the contents of the file are, are different because each of these files has segments of data of various formats. Got it. But yeah, <clears throat> so um, there's a, there's a pro so anyway, so yeah, there's a process whereby we take, let's say, assets that come from Maya files and textures and they, first of all, the Maya file can be exported out into a, oh, this is kind of funny too, we have a, a tool called Maya3n, DB. Now, what does this mean? Well, NDB is the Naughty Dog database format or something. It's like the Naughty Dog like intermediate format. My okay, so Maya three NDB used to be called Maya two NDB with a number two, but it meant like the word two. And then right. somebody thought next version Maya three NDB. Okay. All right. <laughs> so okay. So now it's totally confusing. Sure. So it's totally confusing. Yeah. So anyway, so you get your NDB oh, file. Well. Yeah. Oh well, whatever. There's a lot of fun stuff like that in our um, So you get this crazy NDB file, and then it goes through various other processes and eventually gets packed together with other assets into a pack file. Um, and then, you know, and it could be ZBrush assets, it could be whatever. Um, DC works differently. It goes through the, um, our DC compiler, which actually DC stands for data compiler. Although the programmer, Dan, who works on it, we used to say it was Dan's cool language, but it's actually <laughs> data compiler. And uh, that turns into a thing called a bin file, which is a special format. Um, Charter database, like I say, it goes not through an NDB file per se, but it eventually also becomes a pack file. And all of this metadata is, is getting sucked in to just know how to build all this stuff. So uh, is the, uh, just to tr try to get a, an idea here. So when these lines are going across here, we're talking probably fundamentally about a different program doing various ones of these. Because yeah. like, for example, yeah. you said Maya 3 NDB. It's its own program. It's not some subsection of the asset builder. Right. So the metadata, all of these uh, programs are reading out of that data to figure out how they pack things. So it's kind yeah. of like a, a, a common format among everyone, no matter what you're reading, you right. probably are touching it. Exactly, okay. yeah, exactly. And there's and I'm oversimplifying here. So Maya 3 NDB is the first step where you're taking a Maya format and you're extracting only the bits of the scene graph that matter. And putting them into this format that we can then use to process. From there, we might generate, we might send it through Havoc to generate some collision data and other things. We might send right. it through our geometry processing to get it down to that format that Chris Butcher was talking about where it's like highly optimized for that platform. Right. We, there's bits that are gonna process shaders and build shader code, uh, bits that are gonna deal with textures and so on. Um, and so there's a whole sort of pipeline. So that's why these arrows really represent, you know, various tools that might be running. And usually what we'll, so what we'll do is, um, uh, I'll say, I'd like to rebuild Anim Player. So, excuse me, so we have a little tool called BA, which stands for um, Build Actor, which is another really weird name, but Actor really just means basically a pack file. Okay. And so we say BA, Anim Player, and what that does is it looks through the dependencies, and if you think about this, there's a whole dependency graph, right, where given Anim Player, I say, oh, well, it contains animations A, B, C, and D, and it, those animations depend on these Maya files, and those depend on these metadata da database assets, and these things depend on these ZBrush assets, and whatever it is. And yeah. in general, all of that graph is coming from the metadata DB, or is some of that coming from inside the Maya file because like a texture reference yeah, or yeah. something like this? It, it's coming from a bunch of different okay, places. Okay, so yeah, basically, yeah. graph links in this graph could come from a variety of sources, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and there's there's pros and cons to this. So, uh, for example, uh, as, as many of you probably know, Maya is good at referencing other Maya files, and you can yeah. build up a composite Maya file out of hundreds of other Maya files if you want. Um, so there's those kinds of references. There's references in those Maya files to our materials and our textures and stuff, which are coded relative to the project, but just as paths in a, in a file system. Um, and so like if I've got a texture that's blah, 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 dot TGA and it's sitting in this folder, then the relative path to that is embedded somewhere in that Maya file. Um, it's good in the sense that it's super simple and it's easy to reason about and so on. Yeah. But it's, hard, it's bad in the sense that it's actually tough for us to 
pull on an asset and find out all the dependencies. Right, because you have to parse the Maya file yeah, you have to, to, to figure Maya out what all the things are. And presumably, and I'm just guessing here, knowing the way artists would typically use a Maya setup, yep. uh, it's not as simple as saying anything that's referenced is used. I actually need right. to do the work to walk the tree and say, oh, that was a hidden node, so I don't need to look at that reference. And that was a, you know, this exactly. texture is just for testing or something. So exactly. it gets more complicated than just what are all the XREFs in the thing. Right, or right. Yeah. exactly, exactly. It's, it's tricky. So, um, and we're actually working on solving that problem right now. Christian and his team are doing some really great work on uh, building up an actual like SQL database, you know, relational database that stores this information. Anytime you build an asset, it updates those references so that the next time someone builds, you've got that data. Um, I see. Yeah, because like, I actually wrote a, a tool at one point. We wanted to be able to grab some, you know, assets from let's say Uncharted Three and pull them over into The Last of Us just as a as a test, you okay. know, just to until we had real assets. Yeah. And so I wrote this thing called Grab Asset that would like grab those things, yeah. and everyone <laughs> told me I should shorten it to Grab yeah, ASS. Yeah, 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 yeah. you know, Trying to ma yeah. maintain some decorum. Exactly. <laughs> We're trying. So, um, but what that thing did is it literally would have to. It was slow because it would have to open up all these Maya files and read. And the um, uh, our, our technical directors who are that's our our TDs are not like a normal TD. They're they're more like um, technical Maya people who do Python and they do rigging and they're they're super smart and they know all that stuff. And that's kind of their area. They're like honorary programmers that work in. Um, see, they're I kind see. of like extended tools programmers. Um, so those guys actually came up with um, a way of storing all of those references at the top of the Maya file in a special nodes so that you could just only read the first, you know, K of the file and then get all the references. So so that's good, but even then, it's, it's ugly. So we're moving towards having an actual database uh, where you can just query and find information a lot easier. Uh, so that's going to help a lot. But And so essentially that database in, in <coughs> If we look at how this thing is structured, what we're really saying is, OK, when I build an asset, I'm essentially producing two files, right? I'm producing, or, or two outputs. I'm producing yeah. the actual output that I was trying to build, yeah. but I'm also producing the secondary output, which is possibly going to be shared with other people. Because normally, I guess, you, you only build the one for whatever the, the particular machine is here, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And in the other case, it's like, no, Every time we parse this Maya file, we know that no matter who else will ever build this for any reason, we only need this particular set of data to be processed when that asset changes, right. so let's share it. Yeah, okay. and in fact, there's more than one kind of intermediate file. So when I'm okay. building a single thing like Anim Player, uh, there might be a bunch of intermediate files. A good example is we have a thing called streaming animations where you can have a very long animation, and it gets chunked up into, into little chunks that can be streamed in over time and then right. discarded. And so we might have like a little intermediate file for each chunk. We might, there, we might have intermediate files for Havoc, et cetera. So, so basically, a small number of, or well, sometimes a large number of source assets turn into a very large number of intermediate files, eventually boil down to a single pack file. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so. And are these intermediate files in general, I mean, obviously we're talking about the one where, OK, we want to pre-process -pre sort of the dependencies out of here and put that intermediate file. Yep. It's obvious what that gets used for. Are these intermediate files generally just byproducts of the build process, or are they uh, do they have a life cycle where it's like, oh, yeah, no, we'll reuse one of those if the person, you know, like, mm -hmm. what kind of intermediate file are we talking about? Yeah, yeah. So um, in theory, we could reuse them, and right now we don't, and, okay. it's, and it's a problem. So, oh, really? Um, yeah, so, and actually, all right, so here's the thing. When you build one of these pack files, there's two places they can go. And um, one is, I don't know, so one is our so-called Z drive. Oh, Z, Z. Z drive, and in here maybe we've got like an Uncharted 4 folder, and then in here we have like the build folder, and in here are various subfolders for different kinds of assets, and all of the assets that the game reads come out of there. Um, but then every user also has their own Y drive. And the Y drive is actually, it actually maps to Z slash your username. So it's all in the same file server. And I could have my own local U4 and my own local build. So what I can do is I can say, all right, I'm going to build this asset locally. And the game has a mode where you can say, run it in, in local mode, where it says, all right, I'm going to try to find the asset on Y. And if I can find it, I'll use it. Otherwise, I'll go out to global. And that means I can be, as an animator, testing just my animations, but still having the rest of the game be current. Now, the Z drive is shared by everybody. So if somebody builds an asset globally, it goes out to Z, everybody will see it immediately. As soon as they rerun the game or reload that level, bam, they see it. Right. So now think about this. And this so, is just literally a byproduct of the map drive. It's like, hey, yeah. Windows will try to load it from there, and so it's going to get whatever the last thing copied up there was. Yeah, basically. And it's actually the PS4 reading that. And I oh, can talk right, a little sorry. bit about how that works as well, because normally you go through this thing called the target manager through your PC, and then it talks 
but right. we actually wrote a special file server to make it faster. But okay. well, I can talk more about that later. But anyway, so okay. the idea though is that I'm building these assets globally. I'm building the, glo the game globally, which also gets published up to the Z drive. And anytime anybody runs, they're running the latest, latest version of everything. And of course, right. people code are, and assets. Code and assets, yeah. And also those, those bin files and just, uh, yeah, code and assets. Um, and so when you first tell people that, they usually look at you with this kind of horrific face, like, what? How can you, be, how can you do that? That's total wild, wild west. It won't work. But it totally works. And here's why. Because um, so as a programmer, if I check something in and, and it doesn't compile, I see it immediately in the build button. I get a, I get a message. And that doesn't break anyone because they're not going to get a non-built executable. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So that doesn't break anyone. It just breaks the programmers. They go, hey, I can't build the code. Right. So you immediately quickly jump on that and you fix it. Uh, worst case, you just roll your change back. And then right. you take your time to figure out what you did wrong. Right. Or, or if you can fix it, you just fix it. Um, if you check in something that breaks the game at runtime, it's kind of the same thing. You start getting a barrage of emails from people saying, hey, by the way, yeah. when I spawn the player, he goes, Vroom, and he like, yeah, right, doesn't right, work right. anymore. Um, <laughs> Okay. And so you go, oh crap, what did I do? And yeah, then you yeah. Yeah, either roll it back or you figure it out quickly and you solve it. But here's the thing, what's the easiest problem to solve? The one that you, that you introduced into the code base a month ago and you're not really sure what you did? Or the problem that you just introduced 10 minutes ago? Right? So it turns out that that's just really, really valuable for us. And the it, it, same applies to an, an artist. You know? I check in something and, I, and somehow I managed to unlink a bunch of animations from the pack file, so now nothing worked. Oh my gosh, what did I do? Well, I was just working on this. Oh, that's what I did. So, um, so it's, essentially, it, it, is, really it well. is exactly the reason why, pretty much the standard reason why we always try to reduce the turnaround time is because, hey, seeing yeah. the results has all kinds of positive benefits to exactly. it. So, yes, there may be some downsides to it, but th that's really the most important yeah. part. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and it turns out stability, getting your stability that way is better than getting your stability in kind of a fake way by staging it because now you've got stability because you're running a game that's a week old. Too old. Yeah, okay. and so so we like it. Um, it's okay. not for everybody. Uh, I'd say it works better when you have a, a maybe a slightly smaller team. If, right, if you're 500 just, people, it might be hard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but it definitely works because How we many have, total people are we talking about running, uh, by the way? Just so I'd say at the height of Uncharted 4, we were probably about 300 plus people in so the studio. So kind of close. It's pretty, it's pretty it's, high. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, yes, it's, you know, Every hundred you add is is, ba is yeah, probably yeah. a bad curve, but yeah. it's like it's like it's not like oh we had fifty people. exactly. And, and in terms of programmers, uh, programmers plus the TDs who are kind of like yes. our extended tools department, it's maybe total of 30, 40 people at most, okay. right? So in fact, probably more like well, let's see. 10, 20, yeah, maybe about 30-ish or so. Okay. So um, that's a small enough team. And, and we're, we also kind of have the luxury of um, we tend to just, we hire people who are pretty senior. So we don't have, and unfortunately, it's bad news, unfortunately, that there aren't any uh, internships at Naughty Dog generally, yeah. because we just don't have the bandwidth uh, with such a small engineering team small. Yeah. yeah, to be able to manage, like, to just invest the time in, yeah. in training up a new uh, intern or whatever, yeah. So I will point out the fact that although we have talked about a huge number of things so far, you've yes. still not told us the story that was supposed ah. to start yes. before we got to all yeah, of this. Yeah. No, no, it's good. This is background that's actually okay. important to understand Sand. that story. Okay, yeah. okay so, so in fact, the, the, the nice segue, because uh, the Y and the Z drive, wh what do these things really look like? Well, they're really this thing um, called the NetApp, which is a uh, kind of like a giant NAS, if you will, like a giant network attached storage. Um, super powerful machine that, that serves up these massive drives, right? So this is just and something with tons of drives stuck in it, sitting in some room somewhere. Yeah, exactly, basically, yeah. And I mean, I, honestly, I don't, I, I don't administer the machine. I, I don't think I've ever physically seen it, but okay. I've seen it in my head, and it's very scary. OK, so, um, yeah. so, so we believe there to be yes. a machine of this nature. Right. If there isn't, then it's, it's okay. maybe it's some guy who's just writing <laughs> on cards. And I don't know. But I think, yeah. it's, I think it's a machine. Um, so anyway, uh, um, what, we, what we discovered is, so for all the way even into, into The Last of Us, which was a big game, um, we had some problems, intermittent problems. We'd have like tools randomly failing, or you'd fail to read a, a file, or, or things would get slow, and nobody quite knew why. But, and we would look at various things. On Uncharted 4, as we got into crunch, it really hit us, because um, uh, we actually have we have a farm of machines that build our assets. So that when you build locally, what it's really doing is it's sending off jobs to the, this farm. And on our previous games, it was maybe uh, you know something on the order of 
I don't know, 400 nodes on this, on this farm. And now we've got like 2,600 nodes on the farm, just to give you a sense of how much bigger Uncharted 4 got. And what we started having are these kind of nightmarish things where the whole company would kind of go down and, and the, net, the, the NetApp wouldn't be responding and we didn't know what was going on. It took forever for it to serve up files. Um, so we started... And by we, I mean not me, but you know, Chris somebody Kinnan who's actually seen and, this. Yeah, this somebody piece who's actually seen the, the hardware. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so they, th what they would do is the NetApp has some nice uh, graphing facilities on the web, so you can kind of see what's going on. They would do packet traces, and bear in mind that this is like we're talking, you do a, a, a 10 second packet trace and get you know tens of megabytes of data that you have to sift right. through, and they would because all of those packets are, are just asset transfer for is going to be huge. I mean, it's yeah. constantly saturated. Yeah, it's just probably, constant, right? Yeah, people are building things all the yeah. time, and everything. Everything. And um, so they would trace it down to one person's machine, let's say, that's like, well, whoa, this one person kicked off these jobs that are really slowing things down. And they'd go and maybe say, okay, kill your build. And so it was kind of like a manual form of load balancing where you'd say, Here. too many people are building at once, so this guy, stop. And you know, she's going to stop, and he's going to stop, and then everybody else can finish their builds, and then they'll kick theirs off later. And okay. it got kind of crazy. We, we just and I'm sorry, a, but why was the NetApp machine uh, having trouble with? Yeah. Okay, that's so the, that's okay, the okay, story. Sorry, yeah. I, don't, I wanted to jump ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so, so you're this was just fine. Mitigation. Yeah. You were yes. like, okay, yeah, yeah. we just need to, this to go away for yeah. right now, exactly. and then we're going to dig into this. Exactly. Okay. So, okay. so as we dug in, um, we discovered, for example, that uh, so one of the issues was. Um, our uh, sometimes our, our tools would just fail. They wouldn't launch. Yes. We're like, what's going on? And so we found out that Windows actually, because Windows is now talking through SMB to the NetApp, which is effectively a Linux kind of world, right? And um, uh, Windows has a timeout where if, if just too long goes by between when you've requested something to run, and so it'll just time out and it'll stop. So we are like, okay, well, to deal with that, let's move our, our executables only onto this low pressure drive, a different drive, Got so it. that, right? We started moving a lot of our assets off of the Y drive onto our local C drives. So like the programmers all have their code on C now instead of Y. Um, just doing a lot of those kinds of things. And that helped. Um, Another one that we discovered that was awesome is, you know how Windows, if you change a file and you're in an editor, the editor will go bling, such and such file has changed, so-called change notifications? Well, the entire Z drive was doing change notifications for everybody. Right? Uh, okay. So we turned that off because yeah. that was very bad. Um, <laughs> so that was an issue. Uh, OK, and so then we're like, hey, we need to upgrade the hardware. And so we're like, right, we got a, a better net app that's wider. It's got more cores. But each core is a little slower. But we're like, eh, it's OK. It's, it's a lot wider. It's going to be good. And it actually got worse. We're like, what in the heck's going on? OK. So Cores, you mean so not the, drives. No, I mean cores, yeah. So actual, the, the CPUs. Yeah. OK. Yeah, because this thing is basically a bunch of drives and some CPUs that are sitting there running like an operating system that can deal with all these requests that are coming in, which are coming in over, over network packets, right? To say things like stat this file or give, give me, open this file, give me okay. a file handle to this and so on. Um, it seems kind of surprising to me that you would need particularly heavy hitting hardware for this yeah, process, but. You, you would think, but okay. because there are just so many, I mean, and it's partly because of the granularity. Like, um, just to con contrast it with like in Chris's world, you have you have like a giant blob that is the whole game or that is a whole level. Right. And, uh, and so there's almost no granularity, which right. led to a whole bunch of terrible problems, right? right? But on our side, we have um, very fine-grained files, right? So like each individual animation, and there's lots of little intermediate yes. files. And so now we have the problem of large numbers of files um, all in different folders and so on. Gotcha. And so we discovered something about the way that the NetApp works. And when you think about it, it makes sense. If you've got lots of different people um, you know, doing requests, like give me file handle, stat this file, these kinds of things, um, it turns out that the NetApp has no option other than to serialize all those requests. Okay. Because otherwise, you get into a situation where you, you, re you say, oh, so-and-so, th this file is this big. But meanwhile, someone else is changing it. And right, it's a, sort of a basic multi-threaded kind of issue. You've got a choke point, And that choke point is, is the NetApp serializing everything. So it doesn't it matter how many cores. It doesn't necessarily have no choice but to do it, I, I yeah. suppose we mean it would take more logic for it to do it, which it does not have. So yeah. it cannot yeah. go like, oh, I realize that these two file operations will not conflict, right. ergo, I'll let them go in parallel, whereas these two, I better hold one of them. Right. Okay, right. so it exactly. just goes, anything that touches the metadata yeah. is going in step. Yeah, basically, okay. yeah. And so by getting a machine with more cores where each core was a little slower, it actually made our process worse. Um, and so with that insight, we were able to, um, again, change uh, some of the ways that we're doing things, moving files around, not having, for example, a giant folder with all the material intermediate files all in one giant folder, but putting them into subfolders so that you know you could um, 
so that if you're querying something, you're not querying a huge amount of metadata all at once. Right, right. You're just querying small amounts of metadata, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and it's still, uh, to be honest, we we managed to ship Uncharted 4 with a lot of these problems, but we didn't fully solve it. Okay. And now we're actually looking at um, doing some other things like, for example, taking some blobs of data that really don't need to be files mm -hmm. and serving them up some other way. Okay. You know? so, so we'll see how, how far that goes. But it just, I guess, kind of goes to show that um, uh, you know, this mental model that you might have of a file server is just this idealized thing that, yeah, you ask for a file and it'll give you the file. Yeah, right. No, actually, it's a, it's a computer just like, yeah. you, you know, your PC and it's got software and it's got limitations. And, yeah, and I suppose we also they are presumably optimized for a specific thing to, and if NetApp's primary thing that they tended to test on was not lots of little operations involving the metadata and rather was just like, what's the sustained transfer rates for yeah. large files and this sort of thing, then obviously they're going to have you know, yeah. no idea that this is a crucial problem for exactly, you. Exactly, okay. exactly. I think they learned a lot from, from us calling them up and saying, hey, okay. you know, hey. this is a problem. Yeah, so, okay. but so, um, yeah, so those are kinds of some of the things that we did to, to deal with that, with that issue, yeah. Uh, okay, so let me ask some questions here from, because uh, there's a lot of stuff now that we for sure, we kind of got a lot out there, there. yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, you, you kind of talked a little bit about everyone uh, running the same version of the game, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I'm, when I'm thinking about that, I'm just going like, okay, so we're all using the same asset base. Yeah. And I am, you, you know, if, if this is a very mature type of asset, so we've gotten to the point where we totally know how it works, we're not really fussing with it anymore. Mm -hmm. I get how all the things you said are, are kind of just true. It's like, yeah, okay, I can, you know, all makes sense, it's good. Yeah. But I'm curious about the, the points in time when either, uh, like, I need to make a change to how this asset fundamentally is stored or something like mm -hmm. that because the runtime will read it in. Or, you know, maybe I, uh, I'm just trying to think of, like, cases where that sort of thing happens. Yeah. How do you deal with the fact that, I, okay, I need to check in a change, which the runtime is going to need to read this new format of asset. Yeah. And I know all the assets are not in that format, but everyone's reading off that, and they may not quite have the, like, so it yeah, seems like yeah. there's this kind of weird issue. And I don't want to say, hey, everyone, stop for a second. I'm going to update all the assets right, or something. Right, right, right. So I'm going to say, like, do you put in both versions of the code? Do you do, like, like tell me a little bit about, you know, am I imagining this problem? Does it actually exist? Yeah, what yeah, do I, yeah. what, you know, what happens? Sure. Um, yeah, basically, we just never change anything. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not work. true, not true. Um, no, you're absolutely right. Okay. There's a whole staging um, process. And so, okay. again, super duper simple. What's the simplest thing you can think of for doing this? Um, we do, we probably do that. Um, okay. So, okay. Uh, so one example is, let's say there's a wholesale change to the pack file format. Like, we're introducing some you know, new type of thing that yes. needs to go in there, yeah? Right. Um, what we actually do inside these build folders, if I go to, oops, gotta get it right. Um, if I go to, you know, build, and maybe I've got like um, animations, and so it's like anim, you know, like a streaming animation. And so we just have like a version number on this folder. So it might be like anim50. And then there's a bunch of assets. And the game is configured to read anim50. If I need to make an animation change format that, that is just sweeping and I need to really make some major changes, I'll introduce a new folder called anim51. Right? And I'll start building those assets as a tools programmer. I can just build all those assets. I can kick off, because we do have um, scripts that will automatically build all our assets. And okay. we, we do actually, towards the end of a project, do nightly builds of everything. Okay. So we're cycling through everything and making sure that it's, that all, it's right. all checked in and that it's all working. Okay. Um, and so I can just build everything. It might take all night, but I just build everything. The next morning, we testing the game. Maybe uh, I get a few people to switch over to 51, and we try a bunch of stuff. And when we're confident, OK, it looks, looks good. Fingers crossed. Hold on to your butts. And then we, we flip it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then everybody is on 51, and worst case, it all blows up, and everybody we get 100 emails saying, oh, the game's broken. And then we flip back to 50, and we figure out what we did wrong, and then we stage again. Um, so it. that's one approach. Um, for smaller grained changes, a lot of times you can get away with just doing something that's much more inter incremental. Okay. So example, uh, um, some, of our, some of our data formats might have a little bit of padding so that, you know, room for growth kind of thing. And then I can introduce some new flags or some new fields in there, and it's not going to break anything because nobody's reading that data. It's just zeros in the original data. Got it. 
Uh, another thing we sometimes do, uh, uh, the geometry, um, uh, the folks who are working on geometry processing and so on, introduce this, their own little mechanism where they have a versioning system within the, the pack file where they can say, okay, I've got geometry version 47 and now I'm gonna do geometry version 48 and I'm gonna write some code that says, if I ever read a 47, here's how to transform it into a 48. Okay, you know, so, we so you that might put some like logic in there that's basically saying like, hey, okay, I, I think it's not too big of a deal to yeah. put a little translation in there, let's just do that. And then I don't have to bother with this whole thing like, hey, everyone, switch over to 51. I think we're good. Yeah, like, okay. yeah exactly. And right. so th that helps you. To, and the nice thing about doing it that way, actually, is that, yeah, you can gradually introduce the asset. Um, another good example, actually, excuse me, is animation. So, um, you know, an animation is dependent on the structure of your, of your skeleton, of your yes. hierarchy, right? And if you introduce a change to that hierarchy, you have to rebuild all the animations in theory. But we introduced um, the ability to do some live retargeting, which is super useful. So we can take a, an animation of Drake and play it on Chloe just as okay. a, you know, maybe just as a temporary thing or maybe even to ship the game if it looks good. Um, and so we use that also to, um, uh, to basically say, all right, well, if I've got an old version of the rig or, right. or an animation that's targeting the old version of the rig and I've updated the rig, I can have all those old animations still reference it. So now you have this situation where the game is never 100% on a certain version. It's got like some of its current version, some of its one version back, maybe some of its even two versions back. Um, and then hopefully by the time you ship the game, you've been doing nightly builds and we, we do this thing where we lock down towards the end of the project. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's sort of a, a, a fallow period where people aren't changing too much yeah. and where things can kind of settle out. And at that point, pretty much everything is 100% on the latest version. You know, since you mentioned it here, this is one of the things on the list to, to talk about too. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's, let's ask that lockdown question. You oh, said yeah. that uh, you do have this sort of lockdown process right. and you said you have soft lockdown and hard lockdown. Yeah. So there's, it's kind yeah. of not just one lockdown. There's like right. the you know, lockdown and lockdown. And there's really yeah. lockdown. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. So, so yeah. yeah, just since it came up, why don't you sure. give a little. Sure, I can uh, give you a little, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I mean, every studio does this in some form, right? You at, at, at some point, you got to ship, and you've got to just stop changing stuff, right? Okay. Because, and you know, you've got the designer who's like, "Oh, I just want to tweak this one thing; it's going to be so much cooler." And you got to make that judgment call. And I think this is one place where Naughty Dog's really—it's one of our core competencies—is making that judgment call between what's worth fixing and what's not. Okay. And there are times when we'll do stuff right up to the end that. Other studios would say that's crazy. You can't do that. Like some some uh, you know development director somewhere with his uh, you know spreadsheet or her spreadsheet is going. Oh my God! Like, don't you know? Yeah, how yeah. can you be changing this? But it, we feel it's super important to tell the okay. story properly or to or to just get that level of quality. And on the other hand, there might be something that nobody's ever going to see. And it's like no, we're not fixing that one breakable cover way over there that nobody's ever going to go to. We're just going to leave it because it's too risky to fix it. So the way we do that is. Um, uh, we basically, before a big deadline like E3 or, or actually shipping the game, we go into lockdown periods. In, in there's a soft lockdown where basically you have to coordinate with your lead to check something in. But usually we say yes. So okay. um, people are still going at maybe 75% speed, okay. right? So it's, it's, it's almost a nominal part to just say like, okay, look, now you're going to think about it a little because you have to at least tell me yes. before you do it. Exactly, okay. exactly. And but I'm probably not going to say no. Yes, exactly. And, and speaking to the way Blizzard does it where they have code reviews for every check-in, for us, we feel like that's too, it's too constraining. So we'll do like little code reviews and stuff during that time. Like uh, someone will, uh, you know, one of the programmers will come to me say and say, okay, I'm fixing bug number whatever. And I'll say, okay, well, tell me what the problem is and what your solution is. They'll, they'll talk through it. And we might even do a little code review, look at the diffs, figure out what, what happened. And then I might raise a few issues. Like I say, well, wait a sec, what's the ramifications of that? And you say, oh, I already thought about that. It's blah, 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 blah. Okay. Or, oh, I haven't thought about that. Right. Okay, well, and then let's, like, let's back off yeah, this let's for think a about it. Yeah. Right. And so that's a really nice period of time to just make sure things are gelling. And it also gets people thinking about uh, to get them out of that mindset, right? Because when you're developing, it's full steam ahead and make as many changes as you can and get all the cool stuff in that you want. And at some point, you have to make that mental shift to, okay, it's more important that the game is stable than that your little feature makes it in, right? Like, um, so that helps with that. Now, when you get really close. And I'm uh, assuming this is uh, implicit in this is it's essentially honor system. It's like, yeah. we're not actually sitting there like, you know, having to push a button for the check-in as, no. as, as your lead, I do it. It's more right. just like, look, you're supposed to tell me if you didn't tell me like what's yeah. going on. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and we do once in a while, someone will be like, oh, I didn't hear, I didn't hear that we were in lockdown. Sorry, I checked this in. Yeah. And then we have a look at it, at, you know, post Afterwards, facto yeah. and we say, all right, well, it was all right. It's good. Or, okay, let's back that out or whatever. Um, and 
And so that might be, depending on the deadline, it might be, that might be a week before, it might be just a few days before or whatever. And then just like really close to the deadline, like on the order of days, we'll go into this hard lockdown where you have to get approval for any change from like one of the principals in the company. So it'd be like Evan and Kristoff or the game director, Bruce Straley, uh, or a creative director like Neil Druckmann in the case of, uh, uh, of The Last of Us or Uncharted 4. Um, whoever's in that role, and then possibly also like a programming lead so that we can kind of chime in as far as the, the technical ramifications of that change. Um, and so at that point, it slows us way down, right? And now any change we make, we're making it with a full understanding of the risk versus reward, hopefully. Okay. That's the, the principle of it anyway. And so that's the complete process essentially for going into those lockdown things. So it's yeah. kind of just like basically saying yeah. we're, we're, we're putting impediments in place yeah. in increasing like sort of orders of magnitude until we kind of get to the, the point where yeah. everyone agrees the game is done, yeah. out we go. And a, f a few other subtleties there to mention. Um, so different departments lock down at different rates too. So a good example uh, is, you know, like sound and particle effects tend to be at the end of the pipeline, right? Because they can't be done until right. other things are done, right? Because you need to see how the animation looks in order to time the sounds and exactly. so on. Exactly. Yeah. And if a change in the animation's timing <laughs> happens, the sound has to be all redone sometimes. So, so what you end up with is you have, you know, design and story at one end, and then you have, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, maybe animation and geometry and these kinds of things in physics, and then you have sound and particles at the very end of the pipe. And so usually the lockdown will be everybody except particles and sound, you know, and they okay. get to just keep going. Okay. And so, so in some sense, it's like, again. okay, you know, it's, it's a, it's a wave process. It's like as people's, you know, the, the earlier you are in the dependency chain, yeah, you're getting locked earlier. A little bit earlier. Uh, yes. Because, yeah. you know, yeah. there's, these people need to go home to see their families. Too, yeah. Well, so. yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah, uh, yes. certainly. And, and more, more also just equally important that, uh, uh, because there's, there's a, a, a chain effect, right? So if a design yes. Decision has changed, it can have a big ripple effect. Now that said, yeah. um, and this is another thing I think Naughty Dog does well, is that we we don't make that a hard and fast rule. It's not like right. well, design is locked, I'm sorry, even yeah. though the game sucks if we don't do this, we yeah. can't do it. No. Yeah. Sometimes we'll do it and sometimes particle and sound will hate us for it. <laughs> right, right. But usually those decisions are made like a, you know, a vast majority of the time. Those decisions can be good decisions that have a really good impact on the on the game. Although, again, that's one of those places where we're trying to find the right balance because, um, you know, there is a very real impact on people's lives. When yes, it's exactly. Like, it's it's not just the game at yeah. that point. It's like, well, you know, we we have to sort of be considerate because they are in a different position than we are because yeah. they are they are the people who have to come in last, yes, right? Yeah. Exactly. And in fact, it's a big it is a big issue, especially for particles and sound, where they do tend to work till two a.m., four a.m. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff during the end. And we are trying to to. Um, be more cognizant of those ripple effects yeah. so that we can recognize when they happen and we can make those decisions really, really carefully. I see. So we're, we're trying to get better at that now. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me look at a couple of, first of all, did you have anything else that you wanted to go down oh. there? Because I don't want to, I yeah. won't interrupt you if you're, okay. One yeah. other detail yeah. I should mention is remember I said that we branch our code whenever we've shipped a product. Yes. It isn't after it's shipped, it's actually well before we ship. And okay. so, a um, good example was during the development of The Last of Us, um, Uncharted 3 was still going. In fact, Uncharted 3 was close to shipping while uh, myself and a small skeleton team was starting to get The Last of Us going. Okay. And um, uh, during that time, The Last of Us branched off into U3 Final Branch or whatever, and they were all working there. Meanwhile, we could continue along in, in the main code branch and, and push forward on, on The Last of Us unfettered, right? So that's another aspect of the lockdown. So there's partly honor system and it, there's partly a branch. And that's, that's because like in that mainline branch, you actually don't really distinguish between you know either the, 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 the engine code to the engine code and so on and so forth. Or yeah, kind of, kind okay. of. Actually, that's another thing that's interesting is that um, is that our, our our code structure is kind of like um, there's a bunch of shared libraries um, uh, down here, and then there's there's something that we call common, which is really part of the game, but it's built, like, so it's shared code, but it's built in the context of that game. So <sighs> command, oops, common, yeah, common. Um, you can use that eraser that you, that you kept. Uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know where it is anymore. It's, it's on the back of the. Uh, Ooh. Oh, this is an eraser. I believe. Look at that. <laughs> I like it. Um, OK, so common. Uh, so this is code that's shared, but needs to be built slightly differently for different games. Okay. Um, and then there's the game code itself. And so, and all of this lives in, let's say, the main branch. 
when we branch off, we would make another branch that is, let's say U or U3 final, let's say, back in those days, and it would have the shared code. Oh, and, and the game, of course, there'd be two. There'd be like, there'd be U3 and there'd and be TLU or whatever, yeah. Got it. Um, so in the share, uh, here, we would still have the shared code and we'd have U3, but we wouldn't have the last of us in here at all because who cares, because it's, it's U3 final. Right, right. Meanwhile, the last of us and can still continue developing here. It can change common code. It can change shared code and not break this, which is now kind of locked. So can you give me an example of something that goes in each of these layers? I mean, I can maybe guess, but just yeah. like for, you know, sure. to be explicit about it. So sure, what absolutely. goes in shared, what goes in common, what goes in Yeah, game? yeah, perfect. So um, something that would go in shared would be like the core animation engine, um, you know, a, a lot of the low level rendering uh, pipeline and, and all of that. Um, uh, pretty much, you know, a large part of, of even like the havoc, like dealing with rigid bodies and ragdolls and these kinds of things. Um, common might be something Something like initialization code that sets the engine up, and it's it's like a boilerplate where it's the setup is mostly the same, but it's a little bit I different see. for different games. Okay. So we want to be able to build it differently for different games, but I it's see. still shared. And then game code would be things like you know uh, uh, Drake's uh, code that does the the rope and the sliding and all of these kinds of like player mechanics and and very custom you know weapon things or or whatever. Now another thing is that we will often you know, just for expediency, we sometimes will just develop code in the game, and then eventually we realize, hey, actually this is shareable, let's move it down. Um, so a good example is we, we came up with this system for um, uh, character dialogue that we call the Vox system, and it started out in game, and then it got kind of migrated down into common just as a staging point because there were still some dependencies on the game. And we're actually still in the process now of just removing the last few of those dependencies so that we can migrate it or sort of promote it, if you will, to true shared code, got at it. which point any game could use it, and it's zero dependency on the game itself. So. Uh, now, can, uh, again, uh, sorry to, to drill down on this one point sure, here, because yeah. I'm, just, I'm not sure I totally get it, though. OK. Um, so you know, I've got my shared layer, and that seems pretty straightforward, right? Because it's like I'm literally thinking of this almost as you know, like a middleware library. So it's like I could give this to another game team, and they could potentially use it. Right. Um, but the common layer, I'm not sure I quite understand exactly what something in there looks like. So you said, uh, yeah. for example, initialization code might get built multiple ways, but right. I'm still fundamentally talking about the same piece of code. Are we talking about yeah. pound if thefts? Are we talking about, like, yeah. like, what, are we, like yeah. what are we talking about? Yeah. Just, just yeah, tell, yeah. tell me, uh, yeah, because yeah, I don't. So the difference is that common lives in the same directory structure that all the shared code lives in, okay. and it's treated as shared code. but. In terms of the make files and how it's built, it's built as part of the game. And so I can build the shared libraries um, and not even know which game I'm building. Right? I can okay. say, I want to build the, you know, the such and such shared library. Yes. And I don't know what game I'm building. It's just stuff. Okay. It's just code. Um, it's a library. But with Common, I'm building it in the context of either U3 or The Last of Us or okay. U4 or whatever. And so I can do things like pound, you know, pound if I'm on okay. Big Four, do this special thing. And I say Big Four. Okay. That was our code name for U4. So okay. U4, it, pound if U4, okay. uh, I do uh, some special thing. So that's okay. all that is. So so essentially, that's like. Um, you know, the code itself is actually not changing at all. We're strictly talking about pre-processing kinds of operations that are happening yeah. on it, yeah. uh, but we like to keep those sort of seg you know, <laughs> segmented out yeah. because anyone who puts something in shared, we kind of want to make it very clear that it's like, look, this thing has to not have any of those pound ifs in there. Exactly. We don't want this to be something that where it's got kind of like uh, you know janky stuff that uh, may be building differently or yeah, whatever. Yeah, okay. I mean, so just as an anecdotal thing, when I was at EA, um, I was looking at low-level material code, like shader code or whatever, and there was something in there that said pound if, you know, um, uh, 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 Pacific Assault, right? right Do okay. this thing for yeah. the player's helmet or whatever. It's right. like, really? Like in the yeah. lowest level? Yeah. So we actually disallow it. Like our make files okay. don't even pass those pound if finds down. You can't do pound if, you, you know, U4 in the shared code because it just won't compile. I but see. in the common code, you can't. And so we, the, it's, it's like a nice staging area for moving, promoting things down to shared and also just for players places where you don't have any other choice. And now, obviously, there would be, I mean, if I'm understanding you correctly, there would really be no cost to you in, in sort of the, the uh, you know, pragmatic sense, I suppose, uh -huh. of allowing people to do such pound diffs anywhere they wanted to. Right. So this is uh, more of a discipline thing, where it's like, look, we, we don't want to constantly be having this thing where I go into, like you said, the shader code, and I see all these pound diffs in there, and I, right. I just started The Last of Us, and suddenly I'm trying to wade through you know the Jack and Daxter's ones or whatever, yeah. and this yeah. and that yeah. and the other thing, and exactly. Um, <clears throat> 
Yeah, I don't know if you can get yeah. back to Crash Bandicoot or something like this. Not, no, thank you. Okay. Well, because uh, that but, was all yeah different yeah, code, but yeah, so, yeah. But uh, so it's like we we are really just doing this as a way of, of articulating to the programmer what is expected by the time we get to this thing, so yes. we know that this is something that we can just go with. Yeah. But chances are we don't really want to make all of this code one hundred percent general because right. there's some things that are just mm -hmm. a lot more expedient to do with that if yep. that goes into the common layer. That that can um, okay. now. There's another so. Actually, let me speak to the reason why we do that first. So okay. um, it's partly just that it's good housekeeping, and it, and, yes. it, there's, and it sort of feeds my OCD, mm -hmm. which is nice. Um, simplifies the thinking it, about it. Simplifies the thinking, it, yeah, sense. exactly. Yeah. Um, keeps you honest, I guess, okay. a little bit. But there's other reasons. For example, um, if it, the shared library is quite large, it's, it's a good majority of our code can, can be in shared. And, um, if I can rebuild a shared library and then actually literally share that binary you know, lib between two different games, rather than having to build it differently for different games, that, that gives us a benefit. So there's, there's that. I see. And, um, and that yeah. is from the perspective of, for example, a engineer making a change uh, who wishes to see that change in both engines, and, right. like it's relevant. So at that point, it's like, well, I cut in half the time, per perhaps, right, that I, well, sure. maybe not in half, but, yeah, but I, you, I am saving a little bit there for every I'm saving time. saving a little bit there, exactly. So, so those are two kind of good reasons. I guess the, the third is it, it, again, kind of forces you to just think. Uh, think about your architecture and, and make a good mental distinction between something that is, um, that is game specific and something that isn't. Um, now that said, you're quite right. There are various hooks that we have in the shared library so that you can, for example, have, um, well, like the dialogue system, there might be a place where you need to make a game specific decision as part right. of the normal logic. And so for that, we use like a little, um, like a callback system or a virtual function or like a, uh, you know, a function pointer or something, right. a mechanism in there that will allow us to say, now, now thunk over to some game code, run that game code, and then come back and whatever the results are. Right. So there, there are mechanisms for talking to the shared library in that way. Right. Uh, in a way, the shared, I think of it more as almost a framework for our engine more than a, than okay. a library, per se. Got it. And then the game kind of slots into that a little so, bit. So in some sense, it's it's like the, the shared is, is a very large piece of the code base. And in general, we're trying to kind of keep the game part that we swap in and out being actually much yeah. much less. So if we can promote something shared, we will. Like yeah, exactly. Okay. And I mean, again, all this is tempered with uh, prag pragmatism. So uh, you know, when, you you know, there might be times, well, especially let's say when we do this branch, we do a U4, uh, U3 final or U4 final. Um, if I'm making changes to the shared code in the main branch, I, I, I certainly don't want to be propagating it up to the other branch because it could be risky. Right. And uh, um, so, you know, it, it's all, it's a judgment call, but that's the basic principle that guides uh, the shared code. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, all right, so, uh, okay, but I guess I should ask again. Is that, okay. every, is that everything that you wanted to co cover from the stuff that we talked about there before I... Uh, I, th I think so, yeah. You can always segue back. Okay, no, yes, that's if you think good. of it, certainly. I just yeah. wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I feel like I kind of missed... I, I dropped the ball a little bit on this one because I'm imagining, uh, although this may be somewhat... Uh, uh, this, this may be a, a incorrect imagination, uh, kind of like I'm trying to imagine the, the mythical NetApp device and so on. Right. Um, uh, so you, you mentioned... In, in the in the preamble, that uh, there are some places where Linux really shines. Mm, yes. uh, was this related to the Y Z drive situation? And if so, yeah, I, was, I, I just yeah. wanted to sort of say, can you tell us what that was? I That's a good unpack point. that Easter egg. Yeah, we kind of missed over that a little bit. So yeah, I guess. Um, and again, I'm I'm not a I'm not a network administrator, so I'm kind of echoing what my colleagues have told me about what happened, but. Um, uh, well, so basically, if you're talking, if you're talking to a Windows machine and trying to talk um, to over uh, Samba, right, to yes. to like this Linux box that's serving up all your files, um, turns out Samba as a as a protocol is very chatty. There's a lot of network yeah. traffic that goes back and forth and so on. And then you've got issues of Windows itself, like the timeouts on the executables and these kinds of things. Yes. Um, and so. Like the standard way that a PS3 or a PS4 uh, comes to a developer, there's a thing called the target manager that you run on your PC, and the idea is that it'll serve up files probably just from your drive or from a, a networked PC like, drive. It wasn't really designed for this whole hybrid Linux Windows thing. And it's kind of slow to load data from that. So okay. we realized that actually way back, and uh, uh, Christoph, uh, our you know, co-president, said, all right, well, I'm going to just write a server on Linux that's effectively like a web server that just serves okay. up blobs of data. Okay. And then the, PS, the PS3 or the PS4 can just um, you know, resolve that IP address and talk directly to it and just get its data that way. Right, so effectively yeah. all the, the normal things that Summit does, like discovery of who's on the network and why do you have this drive name and all that stuff, it's like, well, look, we all you know, know yeah. who we're talking to. Let's just get rid of all this exactly. and give me the data. Okay. Exactly, and so uh, uh, although from a sort of a morphological point of view, you're still pinging from PS4 
through to, um, uh, to a machine, a Linux machine, and then to the NetApp versus PS4 to PC to the NetApp, it turns out that path is faster, quite a bit faster. And like yeah. you say, we can eliminate a lot of these extra bells and whistles that we don't need and just serve up the data. And so we end up, uh, we got to a point actually where the game couldn't keep up with the, the amount of data we were feeding it. Because, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, because it was just so efficient. Um, so it, it's really nice. And it, it also means that, um, now it's not exactly the same. If I'm running off of a, an actual pack file that I've built, like, or rather I should say a, um, a Sony like package file, right, a okay, disk image yeah, or whatever, right. if I'm running not, off not of one of those. Not your pack file, not my pack, pack file. Yes, exactly. Um, the, the loading behavior, the streaming behavior of our engine is actually a little different off of that than it is over our network. Okay. But we, we aimed to try to get the throughput to be, um, and like I say, actually the network's faster than okay. reading off a Blu-ray or reading off of uh, the hard drive. Yes, you know, yes, right. certainly. So, um, uh, so anyway, but that's another aspect actually to making a console game where you've got to, you've got to think about and test it both ways because the performance might be different. I'm not sure I understood why Linux shines in that example though. I think I might have missed that part because it sounds yeah. more like you shine. I, or, or, yeah, you, right, in some yeah. sense. I mean, maybe right, like, well, or, well, not you're, me, not but, you, yeah. but your, your team. Right. Uh, it, it's, it's a little that, but it's also that I guess um, the NFS protocol is just inherently a little more efficient, too. So, oh, okay. So um, even if we're just, um, because ultimately, uh, yeah, I, I'm not 100% clear on that, but okay, I, okay. I believe, uh, the, yeah, it's one of those hand wavy things where it's like, yeah, okay. Linux is more efficient at this. I'm at not this exactly sure why. Thing. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, I guess that took care of those two things there because I, I had file server as well, which I guess is exactly that thing with Linux. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So one of the things that uh, that you had mentioned when you were sort of saying here's some stuff that uh, would, would be interesting to talk about from the, from the sort of things that we do, yeah. uh, I'll, I guess I'll randomly pick the order here because I'd, I'd like to get to both of them. We have about uh, 20 minutes left, I think. So you mentioned that you guys sort of do, you said custom version control for assets. Oh, and I was wondering if that, that because you did a thing there where you're like, okay, well, I can have different directories with data. Is, is there mm -hmm. something beyond this? Like, okay, so so yes. give, give us a little perspective of like what you built there, uh, yeah, because yeah, yeah. you didn't just want to check it into your source code control system right. that you use for code. Yeah, it's good. Um, uh, it's good to remember that one. Yeah. So okay. um, when you think about like the different kinds of asset files that you're dealing with, source code and also like these these um, uh, racket or scheme files, right? These DC files, uh, JSON files, text files, all that stuff. It it, it it works well under Perforce, and Perforce is great at those kinds of things. Relatively small files, text formats that can be diffed. You can look back and see the history and so on. Not so good for gigantic Maya files, right? Or big textures, or PSDs, or ZBrush files. Um, uh, so what we do is anything that's that's on that sort of big binary blob of data versus the small text file. Um, we uh, and I've seen this at some other software companies, so it, it's not a new idea, I don't think. But we came up with a new kind of asset control system and we custom built it for better or worse. I mean, now it's it's a bit of a thorn in our side because we have to maintain it, but it's also really, yeah. it's, it can be very powerful and it's got some limitations, but it works pretty well. Um, the idea of it is that, uh, okay, so any of you guys who've worked in a studio might know that you know you have that whole ritual where you come in in the morning and you sync the latest assets and then it takes 15 to 20 minutes or an hour or two hours and you go and have a coffee and talk with your friends while you're waiting for all your assets to come down. On the witness, um, uh, I believe we actually had a thing that someone wrote that does this process for you before you get there. Yeah, so nice. it was, it's like a, nice. it was, it yeah, was a work. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was like, which is an interesting social problem. It's right, like, right, look, right, right. we know everyone's going to have to do this. Let's just yeah. make a thing that does it for Dude, you. Dude, right? yeah, you talk to the iPhone, like the location yeah. services, like, oh, he's like, you, yeah, you know, she, she She's three yeah, minutes yeah, out yeah, from yeah, getting yeah, here. Let's start sinking yes, her yes, assets. Yes. Um, yes. Maybe. Uh, it was, cool, it was yeah. basically a thing that just was like at four in the morning, it, it does yeah, this yeah, thing yeah, right yeah. Right. So, um, but the thing is, if you think about it, like we've got this giant database of very, very large files, Maya files all over the place, and any one person doesn't need all of them. Well, we need all of them, but we don't need all of them to be editable and to be actually on our machine. So here's right, one of the reasons. Right, because fundamentally speaking, each artist is only really working with yeah. some very specific subset. In some small, yeah, in some small world that's a certain set of Maya yeah. files and so on. Um, and so this kind of asset control system, like I said, I've seen it elsewhere, um, it uses Unix or Linux symlinks okay. for basically, so you have like a master repository with all the assets there, uh, and there's one copy of everything that's like the latest version, and there's also previous versions that are encoded in some way using directories or file names or something, right? right. And then you just have symlinks to the latest version on your local machine. So uh, on your Y drive under you know Y U4, there would be an art folder, and that art folder is actually managed by this tool that we call BAM, which I don't know what it stands for, 
oh, actually, I think it stands for Big Asset Manager, because Big was the code name for go. Uncharted at right. the time. Um, and so uh, uh, that's an interesting anecdote. I uh, so I guess Jack had a code name of Next, because they were like, it's the next thing. Okay, right? yeah, yeah. And then so Big was, was big, uh, or, or Uncharted, uh, Uncharted was big, and then The Last of Us was Thing, so we had Next Big Thing. So uh, anyway, oh. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. So yeah. So anyway, you'll see if that I ever say. That's some long-range planning yeah, there. It's kind of weird. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know who thought of that, but it's pretty amazing. Um, so does yeah. this mean you guys cannot start another franchise? That's right. We got to come up with another catchphrase. Peri now. I guess if period could be the period. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Or, or exclamation or, point. Yeah, or ellipsis, yes. and then we go on. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so uh, so what was I saying? So um, oh right, so I was so asking about the, the assets. Yeah, right. So you've got sim links and so you've got sim links. Yeah. yeah. So any given artist um, on their Y drive, they've got all these sim links to every asset in the game, and it's the latest version. And then they've got this tool, which we've also integrated directly into Maya, so they can just go and, and when you check out a file, what it really is doing is co is removing your sim link, copying the real asset down so you now have a copy on your on your Y drive. You edit it and do whatever you want to do. It's it's now locked by the server so nobody else can edit it. And when you're done, you check it in and it becomes a sim link for everybody. And then there's a little server that updates everybody's and sim And the sim link is presumably yeah. marked as like read only or something so someone doesn't change yeah. this, this uh, file. Yes. And so part of that process of checking out that breaks the sim link also turns it into a writable file. So you know if you yeah. try to do Maya would say I can't write the file or something if you were did something exactly. did this process wrong. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So I mean there, there's obviously a lot of benefits to that because everybody has the latest versions of assets all the time. If someone checks something in, everybody just updates kind of magically, which is cool. Um, but there's you know there, there's obviously downsides as well. Like there's a custom tool. So yeah. if something breaks, who are you gonna go to? We gotta fix it. Right. And the people who wrote that have since left, so now somebody else okay. took it over. And, right. You know, we've got poor poor Jerome who's on our tools team and he valiantly <laughs> took up the cause and he's yeah. kind of owning it now but there was another engineer before that and uh, just so there, there's a cost to it and I feel but, like that kind of tool uh, especially has a cost because you're ta once you're talking about something that the artists are supposed to use yeah. typically it makes a big difference if it's integrated into uh, an art package once you're talking about integrating into an art package you're talking yeah. about maintaining uh, you know compiled that. builds for each version of this art package which Possibly, now are yeah. increasingly more frequent and yeah. blah 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 so yeah. it definitely kind of opens up a can of worms where you think well it should be simple it's like, yeah. Well, yeah, is exactly. It yeah, exactly. Uh, and we, we deal with some of that complexity by um, I, we exposed. I, I guess if I'm, I believe I'm correct about this. We exposed like a Python interface to that tool. So that and maybe then you can just you break can just, the coupling there. Yeah. So yeah. We, we and that's that's the thing actually. Like uh, too much coupling in general is always bad, right? Like especially uh, yeah, very tight coupling. And uh, as evidenced by uh, Chris's talk, where right. everything was super tightly coupled, yeah. and you you change one float and everything rebuilds. Yeah. So um, here we're breaking that by just saying, okay, we've got Python Python interfaces to things, and then you can just, which is much more portable, and you don't have to worry too much. But even then, every time we move to a new Maya version, there's a big effort of just making sure everything works because they'll change stuff under the hood. And, so. and is uh, so implicit in, I guess, what you described there. So this would mean that you essentially just store every version of every asset, meaning you just buy more drives, you just keep <laughs> keep piling drives in every day to this this uh, NetApp yeah. thing that we don't know if it exists. Yeah. Uh, yeah <laughs> or is exactly. that roughly how that works? Yeah. Or is that, uh, uh, kind of, except okay. that we do uh, allow ourselves to purge assets after a certain time. So we might keep the last 10 versions of something, and I then see. we purge. I see. Uh, and what we usually do is we wait until Justin, our you know, sort of head of IT, starts screaming that our drive is running out of space. And okay. then, right. then we go, OK, we better run a purge on this okay. stuff, and we'll get rid of some old versions. Okay. But it's dangerous a little bit, right? Because um, if there's something you, you absolutely you need, yeah. Uh, and so back to the compression thing, if you could predict exactly what you needed, then it would yes. be great. Yeah. But we can't. So, um, so we've definitely had a few cases. Just very rare where we've had to go back to a to a tape backup or something to get something. Oh, so but you most do of the time. like offsite these in some well not yes. offsite, but you do have like a sort of a, a purge to permanent storage. It doesn't purge yeah. like it went away forever. Right, right. Okay. Well, we, what it is really is that we're backing up the Z drive and, uh, yeah. and everything else uh, periodically. And so yeah. if even if we purge something, there's probably a backup from before that has it. Okay, so I'm going to ask one more question, then I wanted to ask a, a sort of a, a tie-in question. Sure. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that, uh, this was again in, in the email we were kind of talking about this, yeah. you mentioned that you tend to use uh, command line tools, like simple command line tools a lot. And that was part yeah. of the keep it simple yep. uh, mentality there. But then you said lately you've started to do more stuff like C Sharp QT, PyQT tools, right? Sure, yeah. Um, and so is this just uh, sort of you were finding like 
we need more, like, we're not able to really do everything we want to do in, like, Maya or something or in this. We need our own custom editors. And so yeah. you've been experiencing that. Can you give us a little, like, you know, that's, sure. that's three different things sort of there, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that, that you, to, to a certain extent. Why yeah. three different things? Is it because of what people are comfortable with? Are you experimenting them? Are you going to consolidate? Like, how, yeah. what's, what's going on there? It's, um, I would say it's largely that, excuse me, that you have, um, you have a, a, a team and different people have different ways that they want to solve the problem. And we, you know, so we'll end up having different solutions coming from different areas of the company, and that's fine. So um, a good example is uh, if there's a tool and the artists say they come to the, uh, to the TDs, right, and they say, hey, we, we really need this thing to be automated. Like, I need some way to manage um, my rig, and I'd like to have a graphical interface that looks like this. They go, oh, cool, I'll do that in PyQt, because I know Python, and it fits really well into Maya, because Maya's got the whole Python thing now. And so that's a good solution for that problem. Whereas, let's say our level editor, uh, the programmer who worked on that, Dave Smith, was uh, well-versed in C-sharp. I see. And you know, it's got OpenGL hooks and all that stuff, and it's like, let's just do that. But we didn't have, I wouldn't say that we've, we've got any kind of overarching studio policy that says thou must write their thing in QT or whatever, right? So we're pretty flexible on that. Um, and that sometimes bites us in the butt because, like, some people might not be f familiar with C Sharp, and they go to try to change and now they're charter and now, the whole yeah, thing. And they got to go and talk to David, okay, let me give you a quick, you know, uh, primer on how to build it and everything, and then you learn it. But um, so, you know, pros and cons. I think we are starting to move more more towards uh, Python for those kinds of things in QT kind of as a whole, but it's not like it's a, a mandate. It's just sort so of a slight direction. So it sounds like it's still kind of in its earlier stages of training, like maybe you know yeah. five years from now, you would be like, OK, so this is how we generally go about this process. Yeah. We found that this worked okay. Right, we're kind of feeling yeah. our way a little way bit. Through. Yeah, and I mean, some things, uh, the other thing to, to be aware of, too, is that not every tool is ideal as a UI, right, like as a GUI, because uh, you know, there have been ideas floated sometimes where, oh, let's put all this stuff in a SQL database or something. And then we're like, but wait a sec, what about looking at, at the version history? Or what about doing a simple text search to just be able to find something? Right. And so we tend to, again, try to take those, those ramifications into account and say, you know, let's choose things that are going to remain simple enough that we can actually, or, or let's not lose some of the benefits as we move towards these things. So um, I, I will say, too, this is kind of interesting. Um, the way we build assets right now, uh, it tends to be on a per asset basis. So, uh, and, and the way that our the way that our game worlds work, um, we have a streaming engine, so we can stream in pieces of of, of a world. Uh, and so, just as an example, um, I don't know. Let's think about. Uh, I don't know. You choose a scene from Unchart, you know, Uncharted Four, where there's maybe like a big cityscape or something. Sure. Um, that geometry would be built as maybe the buildings that you're actually standing on and moving around. That's maybe one what we would call a level, but it's really okay. just a chunk of geometry data. And then there's like a mid ground where there might be a bunch of levels that are like this area of town and that area of town. And then there's maybe one that's like a wide that's like all the really low res geometry that's way out there that you're never going to get to. Got it. Um, and those. Those assets are built, um, they're divided up into pages, say, um, uh, you know, whatever, some standard size, like I think uh, we're at like one meg or two meg pages now, but it used to be 512K. And we can load in and out pages, and so as you're just walking through the level, you can stream yes. these pages in and out, right? Um, but those levels themselves, each one of those is a pack file. So if I'm trying to build this entire cityscape, I might need to know that I've got seven levels that have to be built. Okay. And as the background artist, I know this. And so I'm like, oh, I was working on the wide, so I'm just going to do a BL, which is the equivalent of BA, but for levels, um, still just generating a pack file. So BL, this and this, the wide for this and this city. Um, and so that model is, you could think of it as a pull model, right? Where I say, I want this end product, right. and it pulls back on all the dependencies and figures yeah. out and eventually sucks in the, That's the like source. A traditional assets. make. Yeah, very much like make, very much like make. Um, Although the difference is that make, make is very uh, because it's it's based on on file times. That's really the only criteria it can use. Right, 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 yeah. And so it's it's usually actually way too granular. A really good example is uh, I let's say I add some special joint to this rig that's only used by the game to query the position of my nose. Right. Yeah, so I okay. add the nose position joint. Sure. Doesn't affect any any animations at all. But if you were to use make, it would say, oh, the file's newer. Rebuild all right, the animations. Right, right. right. So we we want to be careful of that. So we actually. Chris was saying about, yeah, it's, yeah, so you really want your graph to be as explicit as possible because that reduces the number of things that get touched on a rebuild. Exactly. So you want it to be granular and you want it to be, uh, yeah, explicit. So, so like in that case, um, we, we'll have this idea of a, hier a hierarchy ID and these little helper joints aren't maybe aren't part of that, so it doesn't cause a rebuild as an example. Um, 
So anyway, it's, it's a poll model. But what we don't have right now, and we're moving towards it, is this idea of, like, we have nightly builds, but that's really just like a, a bot, right, that is pretending to be a user right. and pretending to be manually going, BL this, now BL, BL that. that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it might be out on a bunch of machines, so it's in parallel, but it's really just somebody's just building. Um, so the problem that we have right now is that when you build, it, like, so I'm Joe user at Naughty Dog, and I sit down and I say BL some level. What it does is it actually, um, it's pulling your version of the data. And the reason for that is we want to be able to iterate. And we, we have this idea of a local build, but there were bugs in it, and sometimes the local build wouldn't turn out properly. So we, we wanted to reserve the right to be able to do a, effectively a local build of a global asset um, using okay. my data. And the idea is um, I would do this, I would test the game, and if it's all good, then I would check in my files and it's good, I'm done. Okay. But if something broke, then I could like I could undo my change, BL again, and it would put it back to the old way, and then we're good to go. Um, but so what this... What this means is um, that mistakes can happen. Like, for example, let's say I go into uh, Perforce or BAM and I check out a file, right? And I'm working on it and I'm trying something. And I build a few times and then I'm like, yeah, I don't really like that. So I ask my, you know, I, I just, or I just wait till the nightly build overwrites my file and I'm, I'm good. But I forget to undo that check in, that checkout. Right. So now I've got an old version of the file. Okay, so now if Anybody in the company builds this level, it'll be fine. But whenever I build it, it'll go back to the old version got it, got <laughs> that, that's it. checked out on my machine. Right. We had a bunch of problems like that, okay. actually, where we're like, why does this asset keep reverting? And yeah, it turned yeah. out that it was so-and-so. And we go over and go, whoosh, whoosh, you know, got check, it. check, check yes, out your file, yes. you know, undo the check-in. And oh, sorry, OK. And then it was, it was good. So um, we're moving now towards uh, having a pristine global version of the assets that are built by this bot and that nobody can touch. And that way, it's absolutely for sure. And the only way to get a global build to, to actually go out to the company would be to actually check it in. And that way, you just don't have any of these, these issues. So we're moving towards that, but it's not quite there yet. Uh, so last question, I'll try to sneak in here. We've got sure. five minutes left. OK. Um, not from the list. OK. Um, so uh, when Chris was describing their asset system, and this is why I kind of like, having listened to both of them now, I kind of just was sure. curious. Uh, it sounded like one of the really difficult problems there in some of the things they were dealing with was just that a lot of their processing wanted to look across a large number of mm -hmm. uh, disparate assets, right? Yep. And this was a fundamental problem in terms of why the system got slow, because if that was not happening, then it would be very easy to start isolating these, these right. graphs, right? right? So it sounds like you know your system just doesn't really even have that happening very much. Yeah. And so what I'm wondering is do you did you find this to be a limitation and you just we live with the limitation or is it that no actually we we compensate for that by doing a lot of more runtime processing of things or you, yeah. you know is there you kind of see where I'm going with that yeah, it's like, yeah, like yeah. why don't you find that you need these things that, that kind of right. umbrella out right right well I think I was thinking about this myself during during his talk and trying to just trying to get my head around why uh, why they had these big problems and we didn't I think and unfortunately, he's not here this afternoon. Okay. I was talking to him, but uh, I wouldn't—I would have liked to get his input on this. But um, it seems to me like there's two factors at play that caused that that monolithic thing, right? One of them is that you know you have you have a bunch of of assets, of just little dots. Each of these is like an asset that yeah. goes into the game. Yeah. And you've got a whole bunch of source assets, right? And it seems like their dependency graph looked something like this, right? Like right. everything depends yeah. on everything, and so what right. you end up with is. You have the make game button, right? <laughs> and when you press that, 15 million tasks yeah. go off, and it tries to build everything, yeah. right? But if you think about what the, the um, structure of this, uh, and maybe some of that comes actually from premature optimization. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it right. seems to me like, for example, not building a certain shader feature on a certain crate in a yeah. level just because the game isn't referencing that anymore is maybe one you know, bridge too far, right? Okay. Um, so like what we would do is we would say, OK, this crate needs to have that capability. I know that it's used at least one place in the game with that capability. So just in the asset database, in our metadata, we just say, support this feature in the shader. And if nobody pulls on it, eh, Whatever, you know, it just supports I it. See. And so, so it's a little less optimal, but you, you now have a very loose I coupling. See. Yeah? Okay. So now the game object can either pull on it or not, and who cares? Um, so so, so yeah. one way to say this would be like, okay, so rather than trying to automate all this stuff and actually have this 
you know, intelligent system that goes out and figures these things out. It's just yeah. like, just let the artist say that this is what they wanted to have happen during yeah. the build. Yeah. And if they get it wrong, it's OK, because they'll see the result. Yes. But we now know that they, using their intuition, yeah. can fine tune that to the degree that it needs to be Exactly. So it boils okay. down to fully automated versus maybe a little bit more human intervention. Human intervention. But the human intervention always wins, right? Because okay. the humans are smart and smart. they know what they want. Okay. So like, if you think about okay. the, the, the dependency tree in our game might be more, it might look more like, it might look more like this, where you've got, you know, this thing depends on those things, and this depends on these things, and this depends on these things. And once in a while, you might have something that depends across, you know. But the tree looks more like this. And so there's all these very lovely natural, um, if talking about splitting the graph, there's all these lovely sort of natural split points in this graph. Mm -hmm. And so what you really have is a forest of lots of little trees instead right. of one giant Gordian knot of yeah. dependencies, right? Right, right. And for that reason, we can just pull on one of these things, and the build maybe takes five minutes or 15 mm -hmm. or, you know. And now if it's a light bake, then right. maybe it takes hours. But um, depending on the type of asset. And we also leverage the fact that we have different flavors of assets, and each one has its own requirements. Whereas it seems to me like in, in the uh, um, in the Halo system, they were trying to, it was kind of like, oh, here's a cool hammer. Everything's a nail. Like, you know, let's, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. put it all into this one tag file system, and everything's a tag, which sounds cool. It's kind of like in, in, you know, in Unix, everything's a file. It's awesome. But um, maybe, again, just one step too far, and may, in not leveraging the fact that different assets have different qualities. And so we can say, like, hey, animations only depend on this stuff. And we know that. It's a bounded problem. Um, so I think that's probably, that's probably why there's that Th difference. That difference. Yeah. Okay. But then, like I said, the flip side is that we then buy into this idea of having large numbers of little little files on a file server, and we ran into that Which issue. That you're, yeah. right. So yeah. you're kind of having to fight it on the, the back yeah. end. And also, right. I suppose you also have the situation now. It's like, well, OK, so now there is cognitive load for everybody who's ever dealing with these, where like I now have to understand the concept that I need to set these uh, yeah. dependencies up properly and think about how I'm yeah. you know, specifying what needs to get built for what, which you know, it, if you imagine the intelligence system had worked, right. Right, you could get rid of. So it's like yeah. it's kind of this thing. It's like, all right, but we're just saying, yeah, we just don't think it's going right. you know, to I don't think we're going to be able to get there, or, yeah, exactly. or at least not yet. Exactly. And okay. if you think about it, like any game you ship, it, there's this absolute sort of uh, uh, um, platonic perfection of the right. system. Right. And then there's the reality of what you actually ship. Right. right. And um, uh, it sounds like they were trying to go for as close to that platonic perfection as possible with zero human error. Yeah. But the cost they paid for that was just massive right, build times right. in this, yeah. this explosion. Whereas um, we like to, we actually go the other way where we say, let's just make errors as obvious as possible. So a really right, simple right. example is if there's a missing texture, yeah. it's this scrolling, you know, rainbow thing. It's just very obvious. Right, right. Or if, if something fails to connect properly, like you know, this guy said that he wanted that asset, but the asset was renamed, and so the connection is broken, yeah. then it'll just have a red error message over the guy's head saying, could not connect okay. to my nav mesh or okay. whatever, these right, kinds right. of things. right? So uh, that's, the, that's the approach we take. And yes, we're going to miss some things. There's definitely stuff in our game where technically, like we might not notice it until we're playing it at home. We're like, oh, darn it. Look at that. That <laughs> stupid thing. How did that get through? But, you know, but, but that's the trade-off, yeah. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much for, uh, yeah, no, for talking to us. That was fantastic.